So we, we can just keep making this challenge bigger and bigger. One thing is just piling data into a big global stash, right? Where we all can go and start playing with the data. And so that's kind of at this level, where we have in Brazil millions, and now globally it's, on, it's more than one half billion records that are online and openly available that we can get to from this room. Um, but then we can start being smarter about it. So for example, this is, this is an integration diagram about Burma. And you can see this is Burma misspelled because it has, has two R's. And so essentially that can be put through some services that look up and standardize and pick out errors. And so that can then, that incorrect version can then be equated to correct names. And in fact, Burma is a country that bounces between two names. And for example, Cameroon with two O's or O-U. And we all know what those two names mean. It's easier than Burma and Myanmar. It's all, we know that's Cameroon, but if you're searching on a database somewhere and you use C-A-M-E-R-O-U-N, you may not see the records that are stored under C-A-M-E-R-O-O-N. So this is, we can essentially do uh, technology-assisted data cleaning uh, that really make our data better and better, and particularly once they're shared, because then we can look across a bigger and bigger population of data. So now we've got a ton of data available, cleaned up, integrated, but we still need to see the bigger picture. And so this can take us into the challenges of analysis and interpretation. And a few years ago, several of us put together this diagram, published it, and I kind of like the diagram less and less with time. But you can think of these kind of big processes. You know, we have genotype, which translates into phenotype. And phenotypes of different species can interact, and species can interact with their environments and with humans. And some of the second level phenomena would be ecology and loss of biodiversity, which is frequently ecology crossed with human activity. And then we have all of these data products, phylogenetic trees, maps, conservation strategies. And really, we're not going to get to really good quality products, like maybe a conservation strategy, unless we have a lot of good information about all of this. And so that information, we have little bits of it. GenBank, for example, about genotypes. And uh, for distributions of species, we just talked about that. But really, our view of this broader perspective is very fragmentary. For example, there's almost no organized information about interactions among species. Maybe because it's hard to organize, okay? Um, or something that Dave Blackburn can talk more about than I can is good information about phenotype. Again, it's hard to describe a frog, a beetle, and a plant in the same terms, right? So this is kind of a big picture, or one big picture, but the point is that it's a big world of very diverse information, and the big payoffs in this world of information will come from linking across these worlds. So for example, a conservation prioritization might link between geographic distributions of species, taxonomy, and link that to foci of biodiversity loss. And if you can link those three, you can get to a very effective conservation and management strategy. But that's not easy. Linking these worlds of information is hard. 
So this science, sorry, that was all an introduction to biodiversity informatics. We can call this field the application of informatics techniques to biodiversity information for improved capture, cleaning, management, improvement, analysis, and interpretation. Okay, a very useless definition, uh, but I think it helps us to think about the whole breadth of this challenge. And essentially, what this pair of courses is about is a lot of capture. We're gonna go out to the field here in Cameroon or those of you who come from other countries in your home countries. You go out to the field, you make observations, and you turn that into data, okay? Um, and then there will also be some analysis and interpretation when we start talking about species descriptions. And then just a couple comments about the field. Okay, it is a young field, but I also think it's a field that has been born rather poorly, which is to say, you can think about this field from that definition I just gave you, it's going to bounce between data availability, essentially what data are digital, and technology. I just gave you a lot of comments and ideas about technologies that are out there. But then we have these ideas and concepts, things like the theory of evolution and basic ideas from ecology. And so we have these three, not the only three, but these three worlds of of possibilities. And I think you could build an argument that in biodiversity informatics, much of the activity has been over here on the technology and data side, and that the technology and the data have driven which ideas and concepts we have explored. And that's not how science should happen. Which is to say science should happen by us coming in with ideas and concepts, an idea we want to test, some mechanism, some process that we want to explore, and the ideas and the concepts should be driving the technology and the data that get developed. But biodiversity informatics has run the other way. Okay, the ideas and the concepts have been driven, not exclusively, but in large part by the data and the technology. So that to me is a criticism of this young field. And then another point that I'd like to just throw out for you, and kind of each of these points is the subject of another week or two long course, but we can ask essentially where do we lose this information, okay? If we want to know right now about the beetles of Cameroon, Right now, in this room, there's going to be a lot of literature that we don't have access to. There's going to be a lot of specimens that we don't have access to. But there's also going to be a lot of information that you won't have access to if you're in London or in New York City. So we can talk about digital accessible knowledge. And think about this as you know, the, the pipe that brings water into this hotel. It may bring in you know, a cubic meter per second of water, which is far more than the hotel needs. But maybe there's a leak in the main feed, the main pipe that comes into the hotel. Or maybe there are leaks all along the, the, the plumbing system. And so up in room 304, my room, I open the faucet and nothing comes out. Actually, the water here is fine. But my point is, here's the main feed of, of biodiversity information. Some of it has been studied, okay? This box has been studied. A huge amount of biodiversity information is work left to do. And that's a career for each of you and the rest of a career for, for me. Um, that's essentially what is really left to learn. But somebody went out and sampled some, some, set, some subset of biodiversity. And some of that sampling exists as specimens and observational records. 
This is specifically about distributional data. But some of that sampling got lost. Okay, a museum burns down, a researcher dies without having documented his or her data before he or she dies, right? All sorts of ways that data that at one point existed get lost. But let's say the specimen exists in a museum somewhere. Well, some of those specimens have been determined, they've been identified, and some haven't. And so right away, those data are lost. And of the data that have been identified, actually most are still in analog format, which is to say those paper tags with, with permanent ink written on them. Some have been digitized, a lot haven't. And so in terms of digital accessible knowledge, all of those data are lost. <clears throat> right? They don't, they're not part of the water that gets up to my room. Of the data that, that have been digitized, some have just been typed in by a technician and never looked at again. And so those will be dirty data. They'll be full of typographical errors, um, inconsistent descriptions, inconsistent localities. And so even <laughs> digital data can get lost because they're dirty. And by a similar token, digital data can get lost for some purposes because they're not georeferenced. And so these represent really big leaks where data just get lost. And even when data are georeferenced and digital and clean, they may not be published, and when I say published, I don't mean that paper in a journal, I mean shared, okay? Um, so they aren't made available publicly. They can be made available with uh, adherence to global standards or just in some local format that's very difficult to integrate. And then they can be integrated in what we could call a world museum. Okay, one virtual store of data where we can go and get access to all of this information. So each of these blue circles is a leak in our information plumbing. Only the red circle is the information that you can use at the end of the day. And I've in, the cor in, the, in these courses, I've built various examples. I should do one with Cameroon, but it's not really the subject of this course. Um, I've built various examples about information loss. And usually, of the digital data, just from here to here, you lose about 80% of the data. From here to here, you may lose 90% of the data. So this is 20% of 10% of the original. Okay? And I say this to you because in some senses, we're gonna go out in, in this course and we're gonna add to this arrow. There will be biodiversity in Corrup National Park that we're going to turn into sampled biodiversity. And you might be able to make this arrow tenfold larger or a thousandfold larger. But if these leaks are still big, you make no difference here at the end. Okay? So the data that Moses collects on the plants of Corrup National Park, where he's been working for a long time, if those data are determined and digitized and cleaned and georeferenced and published and shared and integrated, then the amount of usable information goes up. But if those data get stopped and leaked at some point in this, nothing changes. So one of the things that I've been pushing over the last several years is to analyze the leaks. Right? Analyze where do we lose information. Because sometimes you fix something here, and even though you fix it, it makes no difference. Okay? 
So we could increase the amount of water coming into this hotel from one meter, one cubic meter per second to two cubic meters per second. But if there are leaks all the way through the plumbing system, there's still no water in your room. Okay? And then one last comment, sorry about the languages, but I don't, I never have time to translate slides. This is coming into, into Mexico. Um, another comment is about developing countries taking control of their own destiny. And this is just a, it's purely correlational. And if you guys have taken a beginning statistics class, you know that correlation does not equal causation. In this case, I believe that correlation does reflect causation. This is Mexico from 1825 to almost present. And this is the number of publications per year on, about Mexican birds. And you can see, um, there's the Mexican Revolution, relatively little happening, okay? It wasn't a good time to be a scientist in Mexico. Um, but then, what I want you to see is the proportion of those publications authored by Mexican scientists. That's the red trace. And what I want you to notice is that that goes from mostly zero, you can see there's the revolution where no Mexican scientists were, were participating. And that proportion comes up and up. You get into the 1990s and it's near half. And you get into the 2000s and it's well above half. And the proportion of non-Mexican authors on those publications goes down to below half. My point here is in this period, essentially 1980 to present, Mexico took control of its biodiversity information. Okay, it created a group called CONABIO. It's a national commission. And CONABIO, by various means, united and shared and integrated millions of records about Mexican biodiversity. Uh, and in the National University and several other universities, there were big efforts aimed at data sharing. And essentially, my firm belief, but again, this is correlation, not causation. My firm belief is that those information sharing exercises are translating into Mexican scientists driving the bus, right? Mexican scientists taking control of their own uh, science. So that's kind of an introduction to biodiversity informatics.